Hello friends and adventurers, and welcome back to Sally Cat Plays Exile 3 Ruined World. A couple episodes ago, people asked me to scry Rentar Irno while I was in Gikra. Now let me do just that. Ooh, yeah, so uh, Rentar is in fact a unique enemy, not just a Vanatai lord. She has absurd amounts of health and spell points. That goes way over the maximum that I can reach with any of my characters. Highly protected and immune to drat near everything. Definitely not someone we want to make angry. <laughs> Anywho. Another thing that I wanted to show off today is Exile 3 does give me the option of creating a new PC. Uh, potentially, anytime I want to. Whenever I'm in Fort Emergence. One moment, please. Alright then, so, PC creation. I'm getting a little fed up with... slight difficulties in combat, and more difficulty with having enough mage lore to learn things. So I'm going to make one or two new PCs. Go to the Options menu and select Create New PC. And I can choose between Human, Nephilim, or Slith. The Nephilim are a race of feline humanoids. Once common on the surface world, they have been hunted to near extinction, although some now remain in exile. Nephilim characters start with better dexterity and are much better at using missile weapons. The Slith Zarakai, Slith's for short, are a race of lizardmen, both strong and smart. Once unknown on the surface world, they are starting to appear there. Slith characters get bonuses to strength and intelligence, and are better at using pole weapons. However, they do come with a hefty 20% penalty to XP gain. Human is the default species in Exile 3. Humans have skins of a variety of hues, and are soft, generally fragile, and incredibly resourceful. I can also select from various advantages and disadvantages. Toughness makes you more resistant to damage. Blows of all sorts have less of an effect. Magically apt is a good one for spellcasters to have. The possessor of this advantage will find that his or her spells will function better. Basically, uh, fireballs do more damage. An ambidextrous warrior, like Pearl, will be able to use one weapon in each hand without any penalties. Normally, using two weapons makes both of them much less likely to hit. Having nimble fingers improves one's chances of picking locks and disarming traps. When underground, knowledge of cave lore helps one hunt and forage for food, and deal better with special circumstances. Good for one character to have. Woodsman is basically just like cave lore except on the surface. When roaming the surface of the world, a woodsman is able to hunt and bring down food, find useful herbs, and deal with circumstances involving nature's adversity. Also, potentially, woodsman and or cave lore will have some extra food spontaneously appear in my inventory. I've never had any issues running low on food, so whatever. Someone with a good constitution will find that poison and disease have a reduced, although not eliminated, effect. I feel like 10% XP is kind of a high amount for such a situational thing. Highly alert people have the edginess that helps them resist magical sleep. In addition, having someone in your group who is highly alert may help keep you from being surprised. An exceptionally strong character will be able to carry much more stuff, and in addition will do a small amount more damage in combat. A very few adventurers have magical blood running in their veins, causing them to heal damage to their bodies at an amazing rate. I gave this trait to Steven, I... It's noticeable, but I'm not sure if it's actually enough for me to really care about it, given that resting and healing are relatively cheap. I might go into the editor at some point and uh, rejigger his stats a little bit. Disadvantages. Sluggish characters just can't move that quickly, even when circumstances seem to demand it. A sluggish character gets fewer action points in combat. Magically inept characters, for some reason, resist the effects of magical items and are unable to use them. Potions and scrolls won't work for them, although worn items, such as rings, will have a small effect. I kind of hate that one. 
Frail characters are cursed at birth with a weak constitution. Poison and disease will have a greater effect on such characters. Chronic disease is the worst disadvantage a character may possess, since completely inept doesn't show up until Avernum. Such characters have a slow, lingering, incurable physical ailment, causing them to occasionally suffer the effects of a mild disease. Basically, they will randomly get diseased throughout the game. A character with a bad back cannot bear to haul too much weight. Such a person cannot carry as much as he or she might have been able to otherwise. Oh, for my new character, I'm thinking of going with someone who can handle traps and also mage lore. And I'm going to keep them human, because if they're not a warrior, they're not going to be getting quite so much experience at first. Let's see, I've already got someone who's highly alert. Yeah, I don't care too much about that. And this screen should be pretty familiar from the previous two games. Okay, everyone, say hello to the new party lineup. Connie is another sword and also backup priest. Peridot is for traps, mage lore, and backup mage spells. And uh, I realized at some point that they generated with only a bronze knife and crude buckler each. I'm having to fix that uh, as best as I can. <laughs> at least I've been able to loot some bandits for some hopefully good things here. And I am right next to Gikra because I want to see if I can access the hidden spell here with Peridot's extra mage lore. Pretty gentle on the poison that time. Look closer. Still unable to decipher them. Dang it. Well, back to Fort Emergence I go. Alright, bronze ring, bronze broadsword. Not great, but pretty decent starting sword and a little bit of money. Again, once I get back to a place where I can actually sell things. Because guess what we're doing for the rest of the episode, kids? I'm gonna start exploring the surface. You emerge from Fort Emergence into the outdoors. A harsh yellow light from above blinds you, and the air smells strange. For a while, the wide openness of the space above you is terrifying. Still, there's nothing to do but press on. Aye, the sun, it burns! You reach the valley, and immediately see a view that brings a tear to your eye. It has been many years since you've seen the surface, those of you who have seen it at all. And, after years of dreaming, here it finally is, laid out before you. Plants are everywhere, and you feel wind, and the sky is a blue richer than any you've ever seen. It's warm and dry, and there can be no doubt you are finally home. You stand there for an hour, just admiring the sight and feeling the sensations. You then make a more careful inspection. This area is very unsettled. There's a river to the south, but no human settlements as far as you can see. This is excellent news. Not only is Fort Emergence under no immediate danger of attack, but there is plenty of room around here for exiles to live. But it wouldn't do to get too excited too soon. There's still plenty to be discovered, and plenty of investigation to do. You'll have to meet the surface people, who are likely to be very different from you. Also, while there is great joy in leaving the caves, it's far more frightening than you thought it would be. After years of tunnels and shadows, the open sky and bright sun leave you feeling constantly blinded and exposed. You are facing momentous events, and the beginning of an exciting and dangerous new age. A new land awaits you. It's time to explore. What a great time to end an episode that would be, huh? But I'm gonna keep going. Hello, what's this? 
This veil is filled with shedded, rapidly crumbling unicorn horns. The rocks have bits of dark fur on them where the beasts rubbed against them. In the distance, you think you can see protruding horns, and many eyes watching you carefully. Ooh, unicorns? There's a cave here, but I'll come back to it later. I've got more surface to explore. You are at the south end of a narrow pass, winding its way through the mountains. This would be a very useful shortcut, but you find no tracks or other signs of humans coming along here. Hmm, okay. Suddenly, a herd of unicorns runs down into the pass and charges you. The vicious, unpleasant creatures have obviously pegged you as an easy meal. Aha! So yes, unicorns are not quite the magical creatures of legend in exile. <laughs> they are more like annoying horse-sized pests. Or maybe some of the games just or maybe one of the games describes them as being more goat-sized. Yeah. Either way, they're mean. They do go down pretty easy to a good fireball, though. Ah, they poisoned me. Okay, and they drop a bunch of horns. I will pick those up for now. And I will cure at least one of these poisons. I'll need to remember going forward just how fragile Connie still is. She'll catch up eventually, I'm sure, but it's a bit weird to be coming in with four higher level and two lower level characters. I have found a coastline. And many trees. And a bridge. A group of soldiers from Farport watches this bridge. They tell you they're making sure none of the slimes cross over to get to Farport. Not being slimes, they let you pass without comment. Slimes? Have we seen any slimes? I haven't seen any slimes. But it's true, I am indeed not a slime. Sharamik, 200 miles east, ferry to Isle of Begale, in Farport. Yes, I deliberately chose to go this way because this was how I just happened to start exploring the surface the very first time I played this game. And I'm guessing the guards won't talk to me. They do not. So I still have some memory of Farport being basically the first surface town I ever explored. Farport docks. Buy tickets to other towns at the docks. At the end of the dock, a ship waits to take intrepid adventurers to far-off lands. Unfortunately, you don't have a ticket. A sailor tells you to buy one from Vok. Are you Vok? You are. A smelly man stands near the docks. He holds several rolls of grimy tickets in his hands. My name's Vok, and I ain't after small talk. I got tickets for Port Townsend and Sheremick. Boat ride. Ten gold each. Ask if you want to purchase one. And don't bug me otherwise. Like I said, I ain't got time for small talk. He spits. I sell the tickets. I hangs out with my own kind. You ain't it. Ooh, okay then. Not entirely sure what his own kind is. Not entirely sure if I want to be his kind. Locked door? How dare. And how about you, good sir? The townsperson doesn't respond. Okay. Yeah, a lot of these little towns have just generic townspeople or farmers. Like that. Ooh, 
Ooh, I see a smithy. And a Neville. In an empire town? What? A muscled, efficiently built Neville stands at the anvil, carefully working an axe head. You cannot help but admire the skill and patience he is putting into working the metal. He turns to you. I am... And please don't ask me to say that again. I do little now. The shortages are great. I cannot travel far. So I stay here and make improvements. Also, since things are rare, if you want, you can do selling. Cha-ching! Excellent, he says. Reselling goods these days is good business. I will sell off my silver necklace. A couple other small items. I might show off the Wand of Vorp once. Since I am in a safe town, after all. Oh, I can't use it in town. I guess I have to use it in combat. I'm pretty sure the Wand of Vorp will severely damage whoever uses it. Whiskers twitching happily, he looks over your weapons. Aha, I cannot buy weapons from him, but I can buy... Enchantments? Enhancements? Something like. He purrs. I can sharpen and treat weapons to make them better. I do this to weapons which are not magic, are identified, and are not already improved. Is this something you might purchase? Kind of interested, but 450 gold is a sort of a lot right now. But what the heck. Bronze broadsword is now bronze broadsword plus one! Huzzah! Port fine foods. A heavy set man with a dark complexion is working hard rolling out pie crusts. His hands and clothes are covered with flour. Also, his name is. The name given is simply Provisioner. He barely looks up from his work. I'm Alfredo. Welcome to my shop. You look to be adventurers. I have all sorts of rations for sale. Quality goods. They'll hold up well while you travel. So we can buy crude rations for pretty cheap. Prices here are extremely cheap. Thank you, Alfredo. I'm sure we will see you again. Because you have been copy-pasted into a bunch of random empire towns. That is a child, and she's not talking to me. Some dusty warehouses. Your gorge rises as you realize what is scuttling before you. It's an enormous cockroach. It's huge and filthy and makes a constant hissing noise. Slimes are one thing, but you can't imagine living someplace infested with these things. Oh look, I've accidentally stumbled upon the second of the great monster plagues of the surface before we even encounter the first one. Giant cockroaches. They nasty. One damage. Great. The roach is dead. The crates are empty of things I care about. Metal bar. Metal bar. Yeah, pretty generic warehouse aside from the giant roach. A library?! There is a woman with robes of a mage and a growing collection of wrinkles sitting at the desk. She was writing when you came in, but stopped in order to speak with you. Now, welcome, exiles. I am sort of an exile, having had to leave my home recently. Now I do a bit of identification, and I'm also a scribe. Also, uh, how did you know we are exiles? 
I understand something of being an exile. I am a native of the Isle of Begale. If you want to go there, you can get a boat at the north end of town. Unfortunately, I had to leave, because I kept being harassed by the Anima. Yeah, we are just learning all sorts of more advanced plot stuff today. The Anima control the Isle of Begale, my longtime home. They make life difficult for any mages there. I can understand their prejudice about magic in this day and age, but you can't blame me for not wanting to be subjected to it. She is unwilling to speak of it. Identification is part and parcel of being a sage. I don't actually have anything to identify right now. I write books. One of mine is on that pedestal over there. She points to the southwest corner of the room. It's a little treatise I threw together. She indicates a scroll on the table in front of her. Now, to make money, I do scrolls. Interested in a purchase? We can get your basic scrolls of Flame, Slow, Poison, Stealth, Ice Bolt, and Fireball. I would prefer to rely on my Garnet. Garnet the character, not Garnet the cat, who's also in here with me. This pedestal has a large scholarly text sitting on it. Browse it. The Place of Valorum, by Nell of the Isle of Begale. The continent of Valorum is the most unusual and wild of the lands controlled by the Empire, and many questions remain about its future. It was only recently settled, after all, and the frontier spirit remains. The people of Valorum have little in common with its Empire cousins. We have not been as controlled by the Empire bureaucracy, and do not share many of its prejudices, such as the hatred of Nephilim and exiles. As more people flood into our land, and we become more similar to the more settled, controlled other empire continents. The question is, how will the wilder spirits of Valorum deal with the inevitable crushing control the empire brings? One thing is for sure. Before long, we will look more and more to Black Crag Fortress, the massive empire stronghold at the north end of Valorum. But will they look down on us with understanding, or not? Hmm. Always good to get some more setting lore. And of course I must check all of the bookshelves. I'm not going to look at the chest. I don't think Nell would appreciate me springing a trap on her personal belongings. Or Selena's bed and breakfast. A tired-looking woman greets you with a cup of tea. I'm Orsina. Or or Selena. Welcome to my homey, rustic little home. She tries to smile warmly, but it just doesn't work out. I run a little bed and breakfast here. There's a nice cozy room available next door for only five gold. It's what I do while my hubby is away. Her eyes get a faraway look, and worry wrinkles appear on her forehead. He's a soldier. He's off fighting. He's off fighting the slimes. She looks very sad. His duty is almost a year more. He's not a young man, and it's terribly dangerous. But I hope, and pray, I'm sure he'll return. I'm sure of it. An uncomfortable silence follows. Mm -hmm. She lets you into the promised cozy room next door, and bids you good night. The next morning, she greets you with hot water, tea, and crumpets. You've spent worse nights. Delightful. Okay, the room next door must be her bedroom, then. Yep. And it's got a book. The Faith of the Anima by Ahonar Magic. It is the lifeblood of our society. We defend with it, build with it, work with it, rely on it, use it to develop and enrich every aspect of our lives. Or do we? Magic does some good, but also does much evil. The common nature of magic puts power into the hands of all. The cruel, the deranged, the exiles. In this book, I explain our faith, which seeks inner peace through the control of this wild power. Okay. One more building to see here. Door 
is locked. Ugh. And pick breaks. So I will just use the standard door opening procedure of cast on lock at it. And this looks like it's just somebody's home. I could steal some pants if I want. And that is all for the town of Farport. Tune in next time, where I'll start getting more into the main plot as the game intended. Until then, have a good one, everybody.